Larissa. I don't know if she can't hear me. Can we start? What do you think? Can you hear me, Sabrina? Yes, I can. I was just checking if she can listen to us. Yeah, she didn't answer, so I'm not sure if she can. Uh, it's up to you. We can start. Okay, so we may. So we, we don't get too late uh, for the other talks. Okay, so let's start. Everybody ready? <laughs> Um, I'm going to ask Arnaldo to put my slides so that I can concentrate. I can't talk without seeing people. That's why I asked him to, to show my slides. Okay. Well, um, good morning to all my colleagues in Brazil and good afternoon to the ones who are not in Brazil right now. Um, this symposium is called Academic and Clinical Research on Aphasia, Facing New Technologies. Uh, I start this session using a little of my time, about five minutes, as the coordinator of the symposium to introduce its components and some basis issues, basic issues that underlie all the presentations. So I have here Diana Boccato, Arnaldo Lima, and João Pedro Gatti, who I supervise in the PhD program in linguistics at the University of Campinas, Sao Paulo, Brazil. Um, we thank all the, the agencies, the grant agencies that support our studies, FAPESP, CAP, CNPq, and UNIVESP. And I thank you all for your presence here. I'm a professor in linguistics at the University of Campinas in Sao Paulo, Brazil, in the field of neurolinguistics. I'm the leader of GELEP, which is a study group on language in aging and in pathologies. Also coordinate one of the three um, groups of CCA, which is a center for the work with the phasic subjects. And the other, uh, as I told you, the other three components are PhD students under my supervision. First of all, I would like to explain the interest of a group of neurolinguists who work with aphasia on a conference of applied psycholinguistics, despite all differences in theoretical methodological principles. Our main purpose in the field is not to establish models of language processing, and we do not work with quantitative statistical methodology. Yesterday, I was very glad to hear Prof, uh, Professor Moraes' speech, and he was talking about the frontiers among the areas that shouldn't exist. So I think it's very nice when we uh, attend conferences in other fields. Although we recognize the contribution of objective studies, approaches of psycholinguistics and traditional neurolinguistics, we look at the linguistic cognitive phenomena from the standpoint of social dialogical practices, presenting and analyzing qualitatively uh, the data that emerge in interactions with aphasic individuals. According to Saitovic, neuropsychology is quite a soup, a system of mental concepts, empirical facts, theoretical constructs, suppositions, and a host of cultural, scientific, personal, and methodological biases. The author uses an image, a metaphor, of a round room with many windows from where different researchers look at the same object of interest uh, located in the center of it. If we do not talk with colleagues from other fields situated at different windows in order to know what they can see from their place, we will continue to stand to understand that object within our narrow vision. What motivates us to be here, besides divulging our work, are the common interests on linguistic cognitive functioning, and we hope to contribute a verse, a metaphor I take from the American writer, poet, Walt Whitman, uh, when wondering about the meaning of life. 
he says the powerful play goes on and you may contribute a verse. Um, next, Arnaldo, please. So the objectives of the symposium in general lines is to discuss the role, relevance and impact of the so-called new technologies and social media, WhatsApp, Zoom, Meet, on aphasia research, including their contribution to the diagnosis of linguistic cognitive difficulties, to the process of language reorganization of aphasic individuals, mainly alternative creative processes of signification, and contribute from the point of view of discursive neurolinguistics to the thematic of the conference, new perspectives in psycholinguistic research, language, culture, technologies. Aphasia, next, Arnold, please. Aphasia is a set of linguistic conditions that follows a focal neurological episode, an ictus, a tumor, a traumatic injury, and so on. Both production and comprehension processes are involved, and all linguistic levels may be impacted to different degrees, from phonetic, phonological, to discursive. In severe cases, other cognitive functions might be altered, such as attention, memory, and perception. One of the reasons aphasia started being studied in linguistics after Jacobson's emphatic call is because it enlightens language normal functioning. In other words, it gives visibility to production and comprehension processes, since it allows investigative phenomena as if they were in slow motion. A discursive approach to aphasia also enables us to infer about alternative processes of signification, a theoretical methodological concept formulated by Kudri, a professor uh, from Unicamp, which has proven to be productive to refer to the creative solutions developed by aphasic individuals to confront the difficulties imposed by aphasia. Next, Arnaldo. CCA was created in 89 and is fruit of a partnership between Yale, the Institute of uh, Languages Studies, and the Medical Sciences faculty, aiming to help aphasic individuals to face the new conditions imposed by aphasia. It's an institutional alternative to reintegrate them in the social groups. It's the locus for the interaction among aphasic and non-aphasic subjects, researchers, professors, families, therapists, undergraduate and postgraduate students. I highlight that the use of the so-called new technologies is not the hardcore of our research. Each component of this symposium will talk about their research, their topics of interest, and also we have been using these social media for a long time, although during the pandemic, we were forced to explore new platforms and apps in order to communicate with the physical individuals and develop language activities, which has been a challenge for all of us researchers and mainly to them, to the physical individuals. I will now pass to my own presentation. And as we are only four in the symposium, besides the five minutes at the end of each work, we might have some extra time at the end of the whole session. Okay, thank you for listening for this introduction. Just a moment, please. We decided to do this introduction so everybody doesn't have to repeat like what CCA is or what kind of research we, we do at Unicamp. Arnaldo? Can you all hear me well? Yes, good, thank you. Yes. Okay. 
Don't tell me it's not working, Arnaldo. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes, but I can't see the... Can you see my screen? Because yeah. I'm already sharing it. No. Okay, I'll, it I'm says start that again. You, it says that you're presenting, but it doesn't show the... The slide? The slide. Okay. Presentation. I'll try again. Okay. It's okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Just a second. I'm turning off my mic. Okay. Now you, you can pass to the second slide, Arnaldo, because I have already introduced me. Mm, okay. Um, so this presentation aims to illustrate the use we make of social media in the work with the physic subjects, and especially to discuss some ethical, cultural aspects of researching neurolinguistics, what we call discursive neurolinguistics, focusing on aphasia uh, with the use of social media as WhatsApp, Instagram, Facebook. I, I'm not to talk about, I'm not going to talk about Zoom or Meet. I will leave this to my student, uh, Diana. At CCA, as already mentioned, uh, you can go on to the next uh, slide, Arnaldo, please, next. Um, at CCA, as already mentioned in the opening of the symposium, such social platforms and media apps have been used for a long time, much before the context of the pandemic, as effective tools for different purposes, for communication, uh, with the physic students, but also they communicate among themselves. For communication, um, sorry, uh, I just skipped one here. Um, to develop activities, linguistic, uh, cognitive activities with them. Uh, to elicit data for master and PhD students for their research products and also because of my own interest on um, WFD, Word Finding Difficulties, with my, is my individual project uh, of CNBK. And uh, I mainly have the interest on uh, the production of paraphasia, uh, paralexia, tip of the tongue phenomenon, anomia. And regarding this slide, I would like to make a few comments. The use of Instagram or Facebook is not a demand from us. It's their choice, the individual's choice, to use these social and public platforms. You may notice that all pictures on the slide are from young people, all of them unfortunately aphasic, as a consequence of a brain stroke, all of them, and very young. They all came to CCA with a very impacted and linguistic production, uh, telegraphic style utterances with the presence of a few open class words, nouns, adjectives, and uninflected verbs, what we call a telegraphic style speech, which um, Arnaldo will talk about. The use of such platforms allows people to build their ethos. They indeed do not need to write anything on the posts. They just need to upload a photo or share a meme, post other people's texts, and therefore they can hide their linguistic difficulties. Um, on these platforms, on these social media, they are not aphasic individuals. They don't show their aphasic difficulties. Um, BM, for instance, which is the, the bottom picture that you have, BM, um, publicizes his and his girlfriend's work, a delivery of natural healthy food, it's called, it's called Mel Cozinha. We know he did not write the text himself, the, the text right behind, uh, uh, to the right of the picture. Um, 
probably his girlfriend did, but nobody knew, needs to know it. Nobody needs to know that he didn't write that post. So these constructions, Ito constructions on Facebook and Instagram, we can see that they have been using a lot, especially the younger uh, aphasics. In the specific case of WhatsApp, and now the next, please. The media offers a set of possibilities send pictures, attach files, capture images instantly from the camera, use audio to record, and also provide tools that facilitate the production of utterances, such as the lexicon options given by the automatic corrector and the nonverbal symbols, the emojis, that can be chosen uh, by the subjects along the process of writing, either to emphasize or to substitute words or ideas. Uh, it's very interesting, I'm showing here with this yellow arrow, that even with the prepositions that are, for example, they are uh, the options given to, to the subjects, many times they choose the wrong one. So uh, doing this microgenetic analysis, I'm going to show later, we can have some ideas, some clues of what's going on in the process of choosing uh, for instance, functional words, okay? Um, the researchers also have some clues on how long they need to elaborate their utterances because we can see in WhatsApp the times when they write the first utterance and then the next utterance. So we have an idea of how long, even with the clues, the correction clues, how much time they have, they needed to elaborate an, an utterance. The use of this media is not always triggered by us proposing the activity, but also the aphasics, they do it. Like GB in this slide, uh, she sent me this picture of her vaccination card. So she was very happy to tell me that she was vaccinated. So she sent the first message and then we talked to her. Like I talked to her, she, she said, she wrote, eu tomei vacina in Portuguese, like I was vaccinated. And at the same time, down the next uh, um, picture, we see that she did the same to Arnaldo, but this time she recorded an audio. She told him, hi, Arnaldo, I was vaccinated, I did it. So different ways of communicating the same thing to different people, the way she feels more comfortable, but it's important for, for them to have someone to, to talk about this, what's important for them. Um, yes, you can, you can uh, go on, Arnold. I just brought some more examples. Uh, the same girl, GB, she sent me pictures in the first slide. She sent me pictures of the reading, the, the book she was reading, Universo na Casca, Numa Casca de Nós by Stephen King. And uh, Stephen Hawking, I changed the, the name, that was interesting. I made a paraphrase here. And then we talked about it. So she, she needed to read aloud to someone. So she started reading on the audios. She said, she, she made some comments that it had been difficult for her to do this. I recorded some audios talking to her, reading, helping her to understand passages of the book. And it's very interesting because when I told her this took like half an hour, and then I told her, I can't do it anymore. I have to go out. So you can keep recording and I'll listen when I come back. But she decided to quit because she can't do this if she doesn't have somebody listening to her at the same time, like online. So she just quit and we did that later on another day. She also works with Diana. Diana is going to talk more about uh, how she does this. Go on, um, Arnaldo. This is another one uh, from uh, BS. Uh, the third slide, the third picture is like he, he always writes to me about the soccer championships. On this day, he wrote that Sao Paulo, his team lost. So it, this is just an example as how they contact us just you know to talk about life. This is the idea. They, they think it's important to talk about what's going on every day. 
and so it's the same like he talks about his treatment he's, he talks about uh, there's also some pragmatic problems i'm not going to talk about all these here because we don't have time but we may notice go on to the next slide arnaldo that i um, what we call microgenetic research is like we we analyze the whole utterance and we find like with the yellow box here uh where words are like he he used the quotations so um is he um already able to use metaphors or to play the game of language again like he said asphalticus instead of aphasicus so i i can um maybe he, he doesn't know how to to write a physicals a physic or as the quotation shows me that he's already playing again the game of language so he he had a very uh, good development during all these years that he's with us uh, but it's still the problems that he has with prepositions we can see in the third picture when he says não deu do São Paulo, which would be não deu pro São Paulo, right? So we can um, make hypotheses of what's going on during this uh, conversation. Go on, Arnaldo. The same here. This is um, uh, uh, pictures from uh, an aphasic lady that goes to CCA, VM. She is a very literate lady who worked as an architect and a plastic artist, often send pictures of her crafts and paintings. Her works are in Rio de Janeiro, where she used to live, but now she lives in Sao Paulo with her family. And sending those pictures of her art somehow helps her to remember that she's still an artist, um, even if she cannot paint as she did before. Um, in this slide, what she writes to me, she also tells me about her vaccination because this has become a very important topic for all of us during the semester. So she told, she tells me that she took the, the she got the vaccine, and then uh, I asked her what she was doing on the during this time, and she said, "Oh, things from work, remembering architecture." and my art, the, the, I don't know how to say carretel, I, I, I don't know, but she did many things with these, um, I, don't, I don't know the name now, but that's okay. Um, just go on, uh, Arnaldo, please. The same thing here, uh, I can just read, communicate with her, but also um, look um, with details of what she's writing to see where she's having problems to write. She decided not to record audio. She doesn't feel uh, comfortable to speak because she has a very hard um, apraxia with uh, um, a motor aphasia. So it's very difficult for her to produce the words. So she rather uh, writes. But go on to the next one, uh, Arnaldo. But then we find that she, in the first one, she says that she's bad with the cell phone and all the digitals. So this is another question for, for us, which is like to include these subjects digitally when we go, can go back with them. We never thought we would have to do this. So we are doing as problems come as we have to face them. And also in the second uh, picture, we also see that she says, "En uma obra preciosa de obra arte fantástica a do mundo." So we, we can see where she's having her difficulties to elaborate her utterance. And in the last box, uh, "Eu só viajei à Europa em 72, maio a em 81." So we can see the, the difficulties she has again with the functional words. Next. Um, I don't know how much time I have spoken, but I'm heading to to the final. Uh, 13 minutes. 13, okay. Uh, one of the main questions that guides our reflection about the use of those apps with the phasic individuals concerns the borders of public private data produced by vulnerable community members. 
In the second slide, they didn't read. I, I don't know if you noticed, but one guy once in a conference, uh, in a conference that we had in Italy, I think he was from Switzerland. He told us, but how can you work with a physics subject using WhatsApp, using, you know, like Instagram? Because once you get out of the clinic, you, you don't talk to the subject anymore. This is ethical, you know, you could not have this kind of relationship with the subjects that you have worked. Well, in Brazil, it's not like this. That's why culture is so important. We, we are talking about this kind of relation. Um, Busato states that every social practice involving a new technology reflects a continuous tension between design, configuration, and use appropriation. And this tension can be a fertile ground for innovation, pedagogical, linguistic, technological, institutional. This tension is certainly still in the air, and we still have a lot to learn about these tools. Vygotsky dedicated a whole chapter, The Problems of Method, to this topic, where he assures that searching for a method is one of the most important requirements for the study and comprehension of human phenomena. In his words, facing new objects of study means to create new methods of investigation and analysis. The author aimed to understand the dynamics of a process which is only possible by finding its genesis and observing its development, the microgenetic paradigm. So I think all this data that we gather from these uh, messages and all the resources we have with them, they are also very important data for our research, but most, most important than just having data is to help them reorganize their language and use these tools properly in order to become again um, in the center of the, the dialogical process. Um, next, Arnaldo. I think I'll just skip this because I have talked a lot about this microgenetic process. Just go on, it's like, yes. For Freitas, a qualitative approach is a natural demand posed by social cultural research to all kinds of phenomena that interest human sciences. Um, the fields that have the interest to understand how things happen rather than stating that they happen. Difficulties and possibilities of aphasic individuals are analyzed within an ecological setting, that is the real dialogical interactions with interlocutors and at the same time with the support of the resources provided by the apps. In this sense, we call social media mediators in the sense given by Vygotsky. And concluding, the last slide, please. Um, for Bakhtin, ethics is a set of obligations, being thinking the most fundamental human problem. Each individual is responsible and responds or must respond for his acts. For Lyon, treatment should not be a process of just language and communication repair, but of facilitating purpose and meaning in life and strengthening ties with others in those natural life contexts that matter the most. So working with aphasic individuals demands a great deal of empathy along the process of language reorganization and therefore intervention through any kind of mediation is an ethical need. Thank you very much. If I could, I would speak like two hours, but I can't. <laughs> so <laughs> I tried to condensate the most I could. But if you have questions or comments. Professor Lillian raised her hand. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Good morning again. Thank you, Rosana, for this brilliant talk. I'm a big fan of your work. I'm always following your work at the CCA. It's fantastic. And it's not only a research group, it's also a, you, you make a, a, a great um, contribution. You give a great contribution to society. I think it's 
by doing research, you are, you are also giving support for people. And this is a nice opportunity because we know that the phasic people, uh, if, if they are not very well supported by the government, yeah, they, or they have to pay for services. And then at least at this time, they have, you give them, you provide them an opportunity to interact and to work with other people, to, to talk, to interact with other people who face the same type of problems. So it's very nice. And they, they may see in you a type of support to helping them understand what's going on and how to, to deal with this new situation. Yeah? And I can imagine how difficult it must, it must be now with this pandemic, because we are all facing this. But it must be even worse uh, when you work with uh, older, uh, older adults. Mm -hmm. Because young, when I, see the, when I saw the photos of some of your participants, yeah, uh, they were young ones. But uh, something that we, we feel now also in our research with the elderly is that many times they cannot interact like one of yours said, yeah? I need the support of someone of someone else to help mm -hmm. me mm -hmm. with the digital world. And so aging is a problem in this situation, yeah, if yeah. the person is not used to technologies. And another thing that we are also facing in our groups is the, the problem of having the access of good technology and good internet. Right. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Then there is always a, a kind of a privilege, uh, those people who have the access, who have good internet, mm -hmm. who have good, uh, say a cell yeah. phone or computer. So it's, you know, even with our students, there are, I have classes with like 50 students and many of them cannot open the camera because they don't have a good internet during the classes. So with the the elders, it's even worse. Like uh, they they don't even have the the cell phone, or they have to use somebody else's. And but I, I'm also a fan of your work, Lillian. I saw your presentation yesterday, and I see how those approaches are complementary, um, the qualitative and uh, you know the kind of uh, of study that you do with them, like uh, asking them like about uh, in the forums that you, you were talking about how how they were literate if they attended school not it was very very nice too so yeah we we love what we do we are resilient it's necessary to be resilient to the research in brazil nowadays and so here we are <laughs> thank you for your comments <laughs> Anybody else? Uh, Sabrina, if you may go on with the second presentation, then at the end we can just talk a little bit with the ones that are here. Thank you. The second one to present will be Diana. Diana is a PhD student too at the University of Campinas. Thanks, Diana, for being here. Thank you, Rosana. It's a pleasure. Hi, everyone. Um, so I am Diana. Um, I will tell you uh, a little bit about my uh, research work. Um, during my master's degree under Professor Rosana's orientation, I developed a research about paralexias uh, that consists in swaps that uh, aphasic individuals, individuals do while engaged in reading aloud tasks, observing and analyzing the phonetic, phonological and semantic relations between the writing words in the text and the words that they effectively re read. Um, now, in my PhD research, I am studying some act and metalinguistic strategies that aphasic individuals use to reach their discursive intention, even despite all their dif difficulties. 
um, this work I am present um, today focus on oral and writing production via WhatsApp and Zoom based on the interaction, interaction between um, uh, me as a researcher and GB, the young lady aphasic, <laughs> uh, referred uh, here as GB. Uh, I will show you some uh, data that can uh, shed lights on the APN metalinguistic strategies during uh, GB's speech re and organization. Um, can you go to the next slide, please, Arnaldo? Um, as we heard from Professor Rosana, a face individuals face a lot of challenge to comprehend and achieve their discursive intent also in oral and writing productions. And in order to assist them, we have been developing several activities involving both modalities. Um, choosing carefully the research methodology, it's very important. We must do this properly if you want to uh, dive into the human phenomenon to make an empiricism with our souls and produce a lively and incarnate research. In this way, qualitative methodology is a very good possibility to elucidate the linguistic cognitive processes that we see in the aphasic individuals. And from case studies as a method, we can get the multiple dimensions present in some specific situation and the, study, um, the case studies that they provide us general perspectives of the individual experience enabling us to construct pictures of a deeper and complex reality. Can you go on, please, Arnaldo? Um, so who is GB, the young lady? GB, who is now uh, 26 years old, suffered a brain stroke when she was uh, just 21 years old, very young. She had a carotid obstruction associated with pre-obesity and phospholipid antibody syndrome, which can cause bloody clots inside the arteries, veins, and organs. It is not ir irrespective that there had been different stroke episodes in her family because her cousin, uh, who is now uh, 27 years old, also had a neurological episode when she was very young too, only 14 years old. Um, before the stroke, GB, this young uh, girl, was studying odontology at a university in Campinas. And since when GB joined uh, us uh, at CCA in 2016, her linguistic production has been characterized by a telegraphic style. And Arnaldo will talk about this in his uh, presentation today. Now we can see here the first data, uh, data one. The title is te uh, GB telling about her neurological episode. Um, Arnaldo, can you... Uh, Go to the five slide, please. <laughs> In the fifth one, oh. right? Oh, no, no, it's right. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, is, is the, the right slide, sorry. Um, here we can see um, how she is talking about her uh, it, neurological episode in 2016 um, and she she is using mostly nouns as beach sea um, and responding um, with yes yep um, uh, we can note here that the telegraphic style that Arnaldo will talk more later uh, we can see uh, 
from GB explaining her neurological episode. And you can notice that her speech was more telegraphed, uh, using mostly nouns as keywords, and she is missing the grammatical or functional words. Can you go on, please, Arnaldo? And now we have uh, we have uh, a narrative from her. She is uh, talking about the neurological episode episode again, but in this year, né? Uh, and we are doing this interaction on Zoom. And now we can note that the, uh, her narrative is longer, more complex, and with more functional words, demonstrating that she has been improving her speech organization and reorganization. We can note here um, more, more functional words and a longer narrative. She is um, telling me the same, uh, the same uh, history. Arnaldo, can you go on, please? And here in this, uh, in this image, we can see the, the photos uh, that she sent, she sends to us. Um, she does a lot of writing and reading activities by herself, but and some activities with with us, and always before the activities, she prepares her room and her study desk. Uh, she likes organizing her materials and books, and also using WhatsApp, she can send the images of books books that she was reading and the texts that she was writing. Can you go on, please, Arnaldo? Can you go on? <laughs> you can go on. <laughs> Thanks. Here, uh, we have uh, another, another activity. Um, she always talks to us through WhatsApp to communicate, communicate her oral articulation difficulties, mostly with complex sounds, with double consonants and longer words. In this case, we have an example of these difficulties with the bru, bru, cri, tra, tru and dra sounds present in the words. Bruxa, which means witch in English, criança, which means child in English, tra Hidratação, which means hydration in English. So she sends us audios trying to pronounce the challenge words and asking us to send her the right pronunciation. It is interesting to observe that she can say these sounds isolatedly. Also, she used some discursive marks as then and look to register where she has punctual pitfalls, and we can observe pauses and hesitations. Also, it is important to observe the audio's time. Uh, a person without aphasia can say the same information in a shorter time, but her the, uh, data show the continuous linguist cognitive reorganization process importance that are present in normal and pathological conditions, um, the pauses and hesitation. Uh, also, without aphasia, we do this. Um, lastly, it is very interesting to observe that she frequently sent us a, an audio on WhatsApp and then sent this a text message too. In these text messages, she selects the audio's keywords, and when she wants to send us first a text, a text message, then she sends an audio after, showing us her attempts to elaborate and re-elaborate her discourse, both in oral and writing modalities.
the next one, Arnaldo, please. <laughs> Thank you. Um, here uh, we have uh, a very um, touchable title. I'm, I will not give up. Um, here we can see the value that GB attributes to reading and writing practices, recognizing the extreme social importance of such activities, even more for a young person who intends to resume her studies at a university. And she is telling me that she uh, that it's hard to her uh, try to read and, and try to write, but she will not give up. And she said, I will not give up. I can read. And everybody can read. And me too. I can read. I have difficulties now, but uh, I will win. I, I am winning every day. Uh, it's hard to turn. Uh, it's hard transla to translate a basic uh, uh, data because um, the correspondence, uh, the sound correspondence. But we we tried. <laughs> Can you? Ah, thank you, Arnaldo. In conclusion, there are important differences between using Zoom and WhatsApp. When we use Zoom, we can have a synchrony interaction more similar to interacting in person. Furthermore, on Zoom, she has to talk faster than she does at the WhatsApp. She comes uh, on a shorter time to produce and respond. So on Zoom, the support in the interlocutor's prompts, prompting, prompting sorry, is more present. Uh, on WhatsApp, to record audios and to write, she has more time to organize her speech because the interaction is asynchronous. But sometimes writing takes more time and it is more challenged than talking. In this way, Zoom and WhatsApp offer different functions providing rich elements to explore the speech reorganization in the context with aphasias. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Diana. Uh, the next, uh, well, uh, first, of course, we have like uh, Sabrina. I don't know how long she took, and I believe st she still has the five minutes. I can't hear you, Sabrina. <laughs> you are mute, <laughs> Sabrina. Ah, just one minute left. <laughs> That's okay. If somebody has a question for for Diana, or we we can just uh, leave the questions to the end of the session. No question. Very good, Diana. Thank you for presenting your um, your work. I had asked my students to talk about what they do because this is something we do too, but it's not like, as I said, the hard, um, hard core of our research. And Deanna is now working with uh, epilinguistic and metalinguistic um, uh, activities. While uh, the aphasic subjects talk, they all always refer to their difficulties and this shows how much quotations how much uh, awareness they have of the problems they they are facing with aphasic aphasia um, but so let's go on to the third presentation arnaldo who is also a phd student in linguistics at unicam hello i'm here Jenna, could you please share oh, my yeah. screen? Yeah. I will share my screen. Just one moment. Okay. So meanwhile, hello everyone. So before starting my talk, I'd like to greet and thank the audience. 
uh, wishing you all good morning to whom is Brazil and good afternoon to whom is abroad. So as Professor Rosana just said, my name is Arnaldo and I'm a PhD student under her supervision uh, at Institute of Language Studies from the University of Campinas. My talk is entitled Utterances Reformulation in non fluent Affixes, Oral and the Written Parallelism under Scrutiny. Um, it also needs to be stressed that this research allows for the financial support furthered by Sao Paulo Research Foundation uh, and with institutional support from University of Campinas. Having this said, let, uh, let us turn to the topic. Please, Diana. Uh, before going into the main topic of my presentation, I'd like to provide beforehand a definition about the phenomenon of telegraphic style in the context of a feature. Telegraphic speech is semiologically bounded up with the phenomenon of a grammatism that, depending on the theory, it can be considered as a syndrome or as a symptom. The traditional characterization of telegraphies is conceived of sentences with absence or substitutions of functional words, as well as the misuse of finite forms of the verbs. So as an example, we can see when Olivia, a woman with aphasia, uh, when she was trying to say that she got utterly shocked when she realized that a very young man had become a physic due to a stroke. So she said, look, look, and also using non-verbal non elements, uh, using gestures. So look, 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 out, God, ma'am, no, ma'am, my God. So she was trying to convince that she was really shocked by uh, such a young man have become a physic. Please, Diana. So within the scope of discursive neurolinguistics, uh, many works among master theses and de doctoral dissertations have been developed to account for the phenomenon. Except from Gindas's work, which was developed according to generative grammar stances, all the studies seek to lay bare aspects of the phenomenon from an enunciative discursive standpoint. To this later end, from the listed studies, I'd like to drive your attention to the studies carried out by myself on the topic, both in master's and currently in a doctorate degree. So I'm doing, I, in my master's, I worked with uh, the functional words, and now I'm work, trying to address the question of the intra and inter very inter cases variation. Next one, please. So since the time limitations precludes a detailed discussion of all the talks outlined for my presentation, I'll dedicate more time discussing the topics distressed by in both phase that is explaining all the explaining and discussing the data, going into a functionalist standpoint for the question, and finally putting forward how the use of social media can impinge upon academic research, especially on the questions regarding the methodology. Next one, please. There are two intertwined, intertwined objectives that I've set for my talk. The first is to provide a qualitative analysis for the grammatical re-elaboration, and additionally, to go into how such re-elaborations may, may enable the analyst to lay bare the process of transproduction. Our data draws most on GLAP database and were produced by GB who is the same participant introduced and characterized by Diane in the previous talk. Please. As for the re-elaboration of GB utterances, the core question to understand whether there is or not a parallelism between oral and the written modalities of her linguistic production. 
That is, RGB's grammatical shortcomings the same in both the written and, the, and the oral production. From the suggested reference, there are different hypotheses and conclusions regarding the question of oral and written parallelism. For instance, allowing for intra and inter cases comparison, Tensak and Dittmann, Tensak and Niemi, as well as Kleppa, don't accept a faithfully correspondence between oral and written production. A different conclusion, however, is reached by other authors which uphold the idea that the production in both modalities are rather alike. Please. Still regarding the scope of my work, it is important to bear in mind that my reflection is based against enunciative discursive neurolinguistics and on the assumptions held by functionalism in linguistics, more specifically on functional discourse grammar. So having been said, let us now turn to the data. Please, Diana. In this episode, GB's communicative intention was to postpone an online meeting we've scheduled. To this end, in the first moment, she mailed me, as you can see in the screenshot. So she was trying to postpone our meeting. So in the, in the first moment, she, she texted me uh, through email. And she, the title of the email is Next Meeting. And she said, Good evening. Are you OK? Tomorrow, 10, activities, no. Thursday, 10, activity, yes. Kisses. Next one, please. It's very likely that GB considered that what she was intending to convene lagged behind what she couldn't write. As for this, she changed the platform and reformulated her written nutrients into an audio message as transcribed. So it was in the same day in, with a few minutes of difference, uh, she sent me this audio. Hey, so tomorrow, Wednesday cannot, Thursday can be, please, apologies, right? Again, please, Diana. In the second episode, we have the same motivation that is to put up a meeting in which once again to be first sent a written message followed by another re-elaboration. So in this time, it was just on WhatsApp that she wrote me firstly, like you can see. Good morning, you okay? Tomorrow at 10, activities, no. But 4 and 30, activity, yes. So, and immediately she sent me an audio. So you can, if we compare the, the written messages, you can see that they are rather alike in terms of structure and lexicon. Uh, and her audio, she said, good morning, Arnaldo. So tomorrow morning, I am gonna go out, you know. Then, is it possible four and a half tomorrow? Tomorrow only, is that okay? Next one, please. By looking back in over the nutrients reformulations, one can see that in the oral construction, she mobilizes more grammatical future features than in the written utterances. One, on one hand, in the oral messages, she'd be able to select and combine finite forms of the verbs and some prepositions. On the other hand, in the written modality, such features are missing. So, as of such aspects, we can ask, on which aspects of the stepwise process of transproduction such linguistic grammatical reformulation, reformulation shed light? Diana, please. So, in order to address this question within functionalism standpoint of language, it is important to bear in mind that, as you can see from the citation, language is conceived of as a functional system in which human beings use grammatical resources at their disposal to communicate. 
it is important to be stressed since there are some functional assistances which denies the notion of system by conceiving, by conceiving language forms in terms of linguistic representations with no differentiations in the cognitive and pragmatic aspects of the language, it is important to, to put forward that we do see language as a system. Next one, please. From FDG point of view, as you can see in Kaiser's words, a sharp distinction is made between what is cognitive in nature and what belongs to the system of a given language itself. So she remarks that, unlike in cognitive linguistics, a sharper distinction is made between cognitive, conceptual, and semantic information. Uh, to her, semantic information, on the other hand, is part of the grammatical system and includes only those parts of a speaker's conceptualized knowledge of the role of the world that are linguistically expressed. Please, Diana. From such point of view, the FG model is guided by the principle of formal encoding. It means that only those cognitive, pragmatic, and contextual representations that are systematically represented into the linguistic form makes up the grammar of a given language. In FG stance, the production of a nutrient takes place in a top-down and stepwise process, that is, Every utterance begins with the commun communicative intention in the conceptual component and is linguistically coded in grammatical component. Until being materialized by the output component, it constantly interacts with contextual component and output component in such process. Please, Diana. As a consequence of such stepwise and formal encode principle, we uphold that the linguistic form itself doesn't reflect faithfully what is in the speaker's mind. Furthermore, since the language system is conceived of means of functional elaboration, the individual has to translate her communicative intention which is cognitive in nature, into an adequate and pragmatic utterance for the interlocutor. So in this point, we are uh, in line with the social, historical, cultural approaches to the relation between language and thought. Uh, this standpoint raises the notion of linearity as a crucial aspect to the attempt to answer the question about the parallelism. That is, since the linearity required by the language system are different for the written and oral modalities, the functional strategies and the functional coding will be of necessity different too. So from this point of view, um, an parallelism or a complete parallelism is not accepted in the point of grammar, uh, functional grammar. It means to say that, albeit the telegraphic style is present both in oral and written productions, the nature of the shortcomings are not the same. So we can see that the telegraphic as a style of production is present uh, both in written methods and audio methods in, in oral production, but the nature of their difficulties are different. That's why the present study and the present study, from a functionalist point of view, the idea of parallelism cannot be accepted. The next one, Tiana, please. So from these, uh, we can ask uh, how social media impede upon academic research on aphasia. Uh, the person with aphasia is first and foremost a contemporary individual and will use all the technological features they have at their disposal. 
The researchers need to allow for such means of human interaction in order to go into how individuals work on language resources into different communicative contexts. Drawing on data from interactions through social media can spark off insightful questions about the pragmatic linguistic strategies during the process of transproduction in a more naturalistic environment. The main aspects bounded up with interaction through social media can spawn fruitful discussions regarding the ethical and methodological aspects for the research held both in neuro and psycholinguistics. And finally, I hope that this reflection can somehow or may somehow shed lights on what these new concepts and insightful questions can be addressed in our field. Next one. That's it. Thank you so much for the attention. Thank you, Arnaldo. We can ask now if people have questions. All right, on time. <laughs> questions or comments? Então, vou tomar um cafezinho. <risos> oh, that's good. <risos> If we were in Portugal, we would have wine. Yeah. Ok, so I think we can go to the last one. Uh, João. Thank you, Arnaldo. Yeah, you're welcome. It was a pleasure. It's a very nice research. You know, I... I I like all of you and I like all, everything you do, you, do, you do in your research. So I'm a very proud supervisor. <laughs> Thank you. We are glad to hear. Okay. So, João, it's your turn now. Uh, is everyone listening to me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Very well. All right. Um, sorry in advance because my English is a little, little crunchy, but I try my best. <laughs> so I'm going to start the presentation. I, I wrote some, some guide, but for, for help me, just a minute. Um, okay. Just a minute. I'm not. Uh, Okay. Everyone seen the presentation? Yes. Okay. So, um, okay, uh, this presentation, um, I, I titled this presentation Signification Alternative Means a non-fluent uh, phasic subject case study. So, okay. Um, okay, hello everyone. Uh, my name is João Pedro. I am a PhD student at University of Campinas and I'm supervised by Professor Rosana. My research is actually uh, focused on language in schizophrenia, but uh, for the fact I've been working um, Uh, on the university extension project for many years with uh, phasic subjects. I decided to bring here uh, with this work some observations I made over uh, this time. So, as, uh, as oh, sorry, just, um, okay. Uh, as I, um, Uh, I already mentioned, we at uh, CCA work with uh, many technological tools that allow uh, phasic subjects to reach uh, the meaning, the, communic the communicative uh, intention, or, simple, or simply be being able to interact. Uh, since many of the subjects use cell phones and communicate uh, through WhatsApp, I decided to use this tool as a way not only to help them, help them with uh, communication, but also to check the limits of their uh, uterine constructions. I think that's the main focus on this work. Um, so, 
the main objective of this work is to use WhatsApp as a tool to verify uh, the uterine's uh, construction capabilities of the uh, phasic subject. More specifically, uh, the use of uh, figures, icons, and symbols provided by the app, which I refer here as a symbolic construction, construction in, in general. Of course, we don't discard uh, the possibility of using uh, the app as a, a mean of communication, but uh, for that, uh, there must be a longer and deeper work. Um, well, it's important to emphasize that the subject studied in this work already makes a successful use of symbolic construction through the use of uh, gestures. So, as a secondary objective, I plan to verify, to check if there is a difference between symbolic constructions through messages and the use of gestures in this case, since both are uh, symbolic actions. Okay. So, uh, methodolo methodological aspects. I'm going to read this one. I think it's going to be easier. So, uh, the research method, 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 method oh, sorry. <laughs> the research me methodology consisted of a longi longitudinal follow-up of an aphasic subject, in this case SS, for a period of six weeks, more specifically, more specifically through the evaluation of her symbolic production skills with icons and symbols present in the app. The analysis uh, followed the microgenetic paradigm that focused attention on the details and minutiae of linguistic productions, allowing researchers to draw hypotheses about the underlying process involved in the work carried by the subject in order to build meaning. Through WhatsApp, we use the figures and icons that represent places, objects, and animals, among others, as well as the emojis, figures that illustrate facial expressions, which aims to translate the emotional state of the speaker. Um, so basically, these are uh, valid methods from our perspective, and they conduct a large part of the research. Uh, developed in our group. Uh, these are issues that were uh, previously uh, discussed by Professor Rosanna, right? Okay. Um, okay, so I think it's important to clarify that the study of alternative signification process is part of the theoretical methodological process of uh, enunciative discursive neurolinguistics. The way in which we interact with a phasic subject, the relationship we build with them at CCA, allow us to build meaning together and consequently transform uh, this context into a mutual system of signification, establishing the way we conduct our research and our work. Okay, so. Um, Okay, it's also important to conceptualize uh, the notion of the symbol or symbolic. Uh, for the purposes of this work, we will consider uh, symbolic construction, uh, the use of icons, symbols, and figures in the context of WhatsApp. Although there are differences between these concepts, uh, this was not relevant for the results in this work. Um, and in general, aphasic subjects uh, have difficulties using the, symbol, the, the symbols. Uh, but in this case, the subject of, of this research has successful uh, skills in using gestures. As I said uh, before, it's some kind of symbolic construction. Okay. Uh, okay, now I'm going to talk about the subject. Um, this case study refers to SS, a young aphasic lady who has a severe efferent non-fluent motor, motor aphasia as a result of a bilateral stroke on the frontal temporal brain region. She has a mild speech apraxia, but uh, mainly presents language alterations in both oral and written language 
in production and comprehension process processes. Uh, SS communicates in most of the interactions through the use of gestures. I forgot to put her age here, um, but I believe she's uh, 45. I'm not sure, uh, but but she's in she's in her 40s. Okay. Now I'm going. Um, oh, j just just some something some observations here. Uh, here we have a picture to uh, represent the region of the lesion. And to complement the information about her, I must say that uh, the use of gestures she makes was the result of a long work with CCA, uh, uh, work with CCA researchers and speech therapists in the CCA. This, show, this shows th that uh, despite the difficulties of verbal projection, she has made uh, some progress in communication through alternative signification process. Uh, <clears throat> and I, I also think it would be interesting, it would be valid to uh, tell a successful example of the, the use of gesture by SS. Um, in Brazil, we have a city called Salto, uh, which literally means uh, fall from waterfall. It's a fall, right? And it's the same word we use for, for hill in this case, it's a uh, it's a uh, homonymy, homonymy. I think I think that's the pronunciation. <laughs> um, so in a certain situation, SS uh, wanted to refer to the city, and she pointed to the hill in her show. So it it, it is a successful use of gest gesture in communication. Now um, I'm going to talk about the data, right? Uh, okay. Um, here uh, we have an activity which uh, she needs to represent the family members through the pictures in to the figures in the app. The intention here was to establish the representation of the people she lives with, so that she could refer to them in the messages with these figures. Um, she needed help. Uh, but managed to select these figures on her cell phone and confirmed that she understood what each one would represent. Uh, she also put a hotel figure to represent her city. I, I'm not sure why, I don't know why, but we continued with this representation because I didn't think it was something absurd, right? Uh, it, just to clarify, the green messages are, are my messages and the white ones are from SS. Uh, here, uh, I tried to see if SS could explain to me these facial expressions that are commonly used in the message exchange exchanges through through the app, and she was able to rec recognize uh, and explain some of them um, to me. But the others, it was not clear she actually recognized them. Um, I would like to point out that due to her difficult in production and comprehension, we are not sure if she understood the given task, but we are certain that in her case, there is no type of visual agnosia that could prevent her from identifying these figures. But in general, I would say that she can identify emotional states represented in the emojis. Um, here we use um, a school symbol to represent me because that's a symbol that um, I liked a lot, and she knows it based on the relationship we've been we've um, we've established over these years. The intention here was to see if she could uh, inter interpret uh, this construction. João was sick. Is sick. Which, which, which something was, um, uh, and in fact, I was sick in the, the week before. Um, and I have to point out that one of the emotional states that she clearly recognized was the figure representing uh, someone sick, which is this green face. 
so she understood the symbols separately, but had difficulties understanding the statement, the uterans as a whole. Um, after ex I explained this to her, uh, I explained the construction to her, she seemed to understood, she, she seemed to, to, to understand the, the expression and even uh, expressed some frustration because it was something apparently very obvious uh, for her. Okay. Uh, more data. Uh, in this example, I asked to assess to build uh, an utterance from the symbols and icons that we are already working with. Um, the utterance was supposed to represent that she and her husband had gone fishing that week. She had she had difficulties at first, again, because she may not have understood exactly the task. But um, with my help, she was able to represent herself and her, her, her husband. And later, I helped her find um, a figure that somehow represents the action of fishing, in this case, the symbol of fish. Uh, she immediately agreed with the choice of this uh, figure, indicating that the construction, the uterines made sense at the end. Uh, this was also an exercise in which she had uh, to construct an utterance. In this case, she should uh, represent that she took her father to the hospital, which was a recurrent activity for her. Um, I would like to, to point out that uh, the image that was supposed to represent her changed several times, several times uh, through, uh, throughout the, the, the messages. But they all represent a woman, so I didn't think there was a problem with that. Uh, once again, she had difficulties in the construction of the uterines, but with my explanation and help, we managed to read a uh, construction that represents the requested actions. Uh, she put uh, in the message the symbol that represented me, uh, and I didn't understand why. Maybe she forgot what, uh, what it meant or misinterpreted. Uh, but I'm not sure. So, yeah. Uh, uh, putting a school in a, in a nutrients uh, concerning her sick father could mean a lot, but I don't do psychoanalysis, fortunately. Jokes aside, I think just it, it was just a random figure. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, uh, first of all, I wish I could bring more data and more hypotheses about this case but uh, the, pand the pandemic context uh, prevented me from uh, continuing uh, to work with SS. But what I can extract from this experience is that there is in fact a symbolic capacity in SS, which, as I said earlier, was built from the work at the CCA. And some of the uh, activities developed here on the mutual knowledge established between her and me as a researcher. And this was important for understanding and interpretate in the uh, understanding and interpretation of many of these uh, symbolic utterances constructed, constructed in, in this work. The next step would be able to understand uh, some specific differences between um, between projection, uh, symbolic projections, between gestures and figures, and to bring a deeper uh, semiotic theory to explain this phenomenon. Uh, but for now, I can think that some difference between the two forms of symbolic construction is that in gestures, uh, she uses her body as a reference point. You know, which allows her to articulate um, the spatial dexis. That's um, uh, uh, an important difference that I, I could observe in this, in this data. So um, I hope to be able to continue this work, which may, may take a while given the situation in our country, but I still have hope. <laughs> So I think that's it, uh, end of presentation. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, João.
Thank you, Sabrina, for staying with us till the end, <laughs> because there are so many other sessions going on at the same time. But it's nice that the session is recorded. So if other people have the, you know, would like to see what we've done here, I'm very proud of all my students, of course. And Sabrina, have you any question or comment to make about them, the presentations? Um, let me just check. Pode falar em português. Sim. I'm going to well, switch. It's nice to, to go on. <laughs> well, that, that's okay. It's up to you. <laughs> Uh, eu primeiro queria parabenizar vocês pelo trabalho. Tá? Uh, acho que trabalhar com, com afasia requer um, um, uma, uma sensibilidade assim, uh, maior. Né? E, bom, eu fui orientando a da Lilian, né? a gente acompanha o, o, o trabalho que, que a professora Rosana desenvolve, né? e, consequentemente, os seus orientandos cada vez se proliferam, né? <risos> e eu queria saber um pouco, na verdade, é uma pergunta bem geral, pode ser respondida por qualquer um de vocês, uh, sobre como acontecem essas pesquisas, né? São todas, são estudos de caso, uh, existem uh, estudos de grupo, como essas pessoas são... Eles são uh, selecionados, tem algum critério baseado num tipo de afasia ou num tipo de produção, de compreensão, que eles, que eles sejam selecionados para observação, para pesquisa, e como essas pessoas encontram, chegam até vocês, uh, uh, se é indicação de, de, de uma instituição de saúde, ou se é um, um, um trabalho da universidade, de divulgação do centro. Então, são pesquisas bem gerais que eu fiquei, são perguntas bem gerais que eu fiquei uhum. bem curiosa, assim, já que temos tempo, por que não, uhum. né? Ok. Uh, posso responder? Uh, eu vou começar pela segunda, uh, tá? Gente... Que é como eles chegam até nós. Bom, esse trabalho no Centro de Convênios de Afásicos, ele já tem mais de 30 anos, né? É, nós comemoramos há pouco tempo os 30 anos do Diário de Narciso, que é o trabalho de Kudri, que instaura essa neurolinguística enunciativa discursiva, e isso foi assim, na década de 80, então ela começou com alguns grupos que os, os, eram pacientes lá do Hospital das Clínicas da Neurologia, e tinha uma fonoaudióloga que atendia, e eles começaram a unir esses pacientes para interagir, isso deu muito certo, e essa foi a origem desse centro de convênio de afásicos, né. Depois ele passou para o Instituto de Estudos da Linguagem, que eu acho que é, de fato, o melhor lugar para ele estar, e, e aí, hoje são três grupos, né, que funcionam no IEL eu coordeno um desses grupos, que é o Grupo 3, desde 2006. Eu entrei na Unicamp como docente em 2004, mas fui aluna na década de 80, então também estou há 30 anos trabalhando com os afásicos. E alguns desses afásicos chegam por meio dessa indicação dos profissionais da, da, das clínicas, do hospital das clínicas, né? Então, ou neurologista, ou alguém que esteja trabalhando lá como fonoaudióloga, ou alguém que faz triagem no CEPRE, que é o Centro de Reabilitação do Curso de Fonoaudiologia, que acha que participar de um grupo vai fazer bem para eles, mas é muito interessante também que alguns vêm pelos próprios sujeitos que já estão participando, porque eles estão em contato em outros lugares, nos hospitais, nas clínicas, na fisioterapia, com outras pessoas que são afásicas. Então, eles acabam sendo as pessoas que mais divulgam o trabalho que a gente faz do CCA. Então, nós temos essa entrada também. Então, assim, não, não, é, e não tem o conceito de alta. Ah, ficou dois anos, tá melhor, tchau. Não, a gente é coração de mãe, né? Vai abrigando esses sujeitos, alguns, infelizmente, têm uma piora na saúde, aí acabam saindo... É, às vezes a gente tem mais, chega assim a 15 sujeitos em cada grupo, às vezes um pouco menos, então tem uma dinâmica muito particular, não é uma clínica no sentido formal, né, embora a gente tenha essa relação com o curso de 
fonoaudiologia. Então, eles chegam por diversos, <risos> por diversos caminhos, né? E, e, em geral, não saem, né? Só saem por pioras na, na condição de saúde mesmo, ou, às vezes, por questões de transporte. E são pessoas de menos favorecidas socialmente, evidentemente, né? Como a Lilian colocou. É, eles não têm condições, às vezes tem que pagar por esse tipo de, de terapia ou de trabalho com a linguagem. Se eles têm que optar, eles vão para fisioterapia, não fazem o trabalho com a linguagem, e isso é uma coisa que acaba faltando muito. Só para você saber, se pergunta para um familiar, é, se tivesse que investir, por exemplo, na fisioterapia ou na fono, o que, que eles achariam melhor? Eles sempre falam na fisioterapia, porque tem essa questão da dificuldade com o corpo, né, da dependência dos familiares. Agora, se pergunta para os afásicos o que, que é mais importante, eles dizem que é falar, né, que é se comunicar. É uma coisa, assim, muito interessante. Quanto, assim, a gente não faz triagem quanto ao tipo de afasia. Então, não tem teste para dizer... Esses... Conversando com esses sujeitos durante 10 minutos, você já sabe se eles são, tem a fazia motora ou tem uma fazia mais sensorial, posterior. Com a, a continuidade do trabalho e por meio dessa análise microgenética que a gente faz dos dados, mas também enquanto está interagindo com eles, a gente vai percebendo quais são essas dificuldades. Então, para esse evento, a gente trouxe essas questões da... Da, da, do uso do, dos aplicativos, né? Quando a gente pensou nesse congresso, dois Super anos atrás... Super interessante. Então, quando a gente pensou dois anos atrás, em 2019, a gente falou, vamos fazer, né? Como um dos temas do congresso é a questão das tecnologias, vamos propor, então, o que é que a gente já faz com eles e vamos implementar esse trabalho, incluir digitalmente. Só que aí entrou a pandemia e isso foi, né? Como o João falou, foi... Assim, muita coisa que a gente gostaria de ter feito não deu para fazer. Então, a gente trabalhou com os dados que a gente tinha Sim. e com alguns dados dessas interações durante a pandemia. Porque alguns deles interagem, como a GB. Mas outros não, não, não têm essa... Né, essa não, não conseguem, não têm equipamento, não têm internet. Então, nós tentamos fazer uma reunião com eles em outubro do ano passado e foi assim, muito frustrante para todos porque eles tiveram dificuldades com os recursos, tinham que ter alguém da família do lado que ficava fazendo outras coisas, e aí não dava certo, então, assim, foi muito frustrante, né? Por mais que a gente quisesse continuar o trabalho. E aí, assim, é, a gente não aplica teste para saber se tem problema de nomeação, a gramatismo, mas a gente acaba uhum. vendo tudo isso acontecer nessa, nesses processos dialógicos. Então, é como diz a Freitas, né, a pesquisa qualitativa, ela demanda, né, esse tipo de análise microgenética, que você vai lá, procura onde é que tem alguma coisa, né, que possa te dar é, ideias, né, que você possa fazer hipóteses sobre o funcionamento. Então, assim, é um trabalho que <risos> dá muito trabalho, porque, por exemplo, para transcrever uma hora de fala de sujeito afásico, é, entre transcrever e rever, para cada uma hora de fala, daria sete, oito horas de transcrição, né, e essa busca dos indícios, né, então, para tentar entender se essas categorias da teoria resistem ou não, né, se a gente questiona muito, por exemplo, a anomia, porque o sujeito não consegue falar o nome da coisa, então ele é anômico, é como se ele tivesse perdido a representação do símbolo, não, mas ele entende, ele é capaz de apontar, ele faz gesto, que nem essa que o João falou, né, de mostrar o salto do sapato para se referir ao salto da cachoeira. São, são processos super complexos, né? Então, entender esses processos tem essa volta para a teoria neurolinguística e tem essa volta que é muito importante, que é o que a gente considera ético, que é intervir. Né? Intervir para que eles desenvolvam esses processos alternativos, enfim. Então, é, basicamente é isso. Não sei se meus alunos querem dizer alguma coisa, complementar. É apaixonante, né? A gente, é, sim, <risos> se apaixona não só pelos sujeitos, né, com, com os quais a gente trabalha, mas também pelo por trabalho. Por essa teoria, pelo é. trabalho, né? A gente defende com <risos> É, só complementando... Essa abordagem... É. 
Só complementando um pouco, que você tinha perguntado se eram sempre estudos de caso, né? Ah, ok. Uhum. É, e aí, na, nem, Sim. É, nem sempre, porque, por exemplo, assim, claro que a gente não parte de uma, vamos dizer assim, de uma pré-definição dos, dos fenômenos, né? Uhum. E aí a gente vai, como Sim. a professora Rosana disse, a gente vai entendendo, assim, dentro dos episódios dialógicos o que está acontecendo com cada caso, e a gente vai falando assim, bom, por exemplo, eu estudo fala telegráfica, né? É, esses enunciados de estilo telegráfico. No meu mestrado, eu trabalhei com quatro sujeitos, e no doutorado, estou com quatro também, talvez indo para um quinto, mas não, não sei ainda. Então, assim, a gente... É, tenta não, não se apegar muito na semiologia das afasias, né, porque é uma questão bastante complexa e que a gente tenta abordar de uma maneira crítica também. É, então, a gente vê o que está acontecendo com o sujeito e vê, bom, isso aqui parece que é o fenômeno que eu estou estudando. E, a partir daí, a gente vai agrupando né, os sujeitos nas pesquisas. E, mas também a gente faz estudo de caso também, por exemplo, o da Diana foi um estudo de caso com o caso das paralexias, e assim a gente vai desenvolvendo. É meio que os dados falam para gente como a gente tem que resolver a situação. É isso, é, é isso que naquela é... passagem da Rosana, né, sobre, a, sobre a, as questões da Freitas, ela coloca que como uma demanda né, natural para esse tipo de pesquisa que a gente faz. É, o estudo uhum. de caso, né, a gente vê que tem muitos autores que uh, consideram que seja científico, sim, muito, embora muita gente diz assim, mas você não vai fazer uma teoria de um sujeito? Não, não é isso, né? Mas o estudo de caso, ele dá visibilidade para os processos, né? É, o Michelli, sim. por exemplo, que é um neurologista, também neuropsicólogo, ele fala assim que a maior parte da... da do conhecimento que a gente tem sobre as afasias, vieram de estudos de caso, assim, veio, né, essa maior parte veio de estudos de caso. É então, o estudo, é, sim, então a maior parte desses estudos, a gente faz muito estudo de caso porque eles ajudam a dar visibilidade, então a gente percebe uma dificuldade, faz uma hipótese, como é que a gente testa? A gente não vai aplicar teste neurolinguístico, a gente vai estudar aquele caso a fundo, ver como é que esse sujeito chegou no CCA, como a Diana mostrou lá nos dados, né? Chega uma, uma menina que fala poucas palavras, alguns substantivos, depois ela mostra, um pouco tempo depois, já narrativas, né? Narrativas que ainda têm dificuldades, ainda apresentam problemas de gramática, de léxico, mas houve aí um ganho muito grande. E qual foi esse ganho? A gente ficou treinando palavras com ele? Não, a gente não faz isso, né? Que a clínica tradicional faz. Ah, então, tem dificuldade uhum. com os nomes? Vamos repetir. Tem dificuldade com a gramática? Vamos escrever sentença. Não é isso que a gente faz, né? Então, o que é que levou um sujeito só a neuroplasticidade? Não, tem neuroplasticidade, mas tem muito trabalho aí, né? Da gente e do sujeito. Veja o material todo que ela manda para Diana, assim... Até cansa, né, Diana, de ver tanta coisa que ela faz, porque ela quer voltar, ela fazia faculdade, ela parou, então ela quer... Então, assim, também tem essa coisa da subjetividade, né, cada um tem o seu objetivo. Então, por exemplo, a Masa sempre fala agora da... Quando chega num ponto que eles têm também uma certa comodidade, né, por exemplo, aquele menino que trabalha com a namorada e faz a, a cozinha, entrega as comidas, ele faz também a comida, ele faz, ele entrega. É, ele, assim, quem, quem conversa com ele, é, quem vê as coisas dele, por exemplo, no Instagram, não tem ideia de quanto ele ainda tem dificuldades, né? Você vai conversar com ele, você vê que ainda tem uma fala telegrafa, mas se vira, né? Mas não era assim, no começo ele chegou, ele, ele só falava... Como é que era a expressão, gente, que ele falava sempre? Porque eu falei para ele, você não pode se acomodar falando ele essa falava, expressão. Ele ah, falava tipo cara. Tipo, ah, isso, cara. tipo cara. Então ele ficava usando assim, algumas estratégias para disfarçar as dificuldades, mas ele não ia conseguir também produzir muito mais do que isso. Então a gente ficava pegando no pé dele. Não, peraí, você tem condições de fazer um enunciado, né? E, e a gente vê que, de fato, tem esse desenvolvimento. Então, é um trabalho, mas para fazer isso, você tem que entender de linguagem. Né? Então, tem gente que fala assim, mas vocês só conversam com eles? Eu falo, gente, 
para essa conversa com eles, a gente tem que mobilizar toda uma teoria de linguagem, de sujeito, de cérebro, de, de interação, né? É, então a gente vê que os estudos de caso também mostram isso, né? Como é que o sujeito era? Como é que ele está agora? O que, que foi feito para ele ter esse desenvolvimento? Então, é, é difícil, a gente gasta saliva para explicar e para convencer. Mas é, é, uma, é uma outra abordagem, enfim. Uhum. Uh... Foi bem, bem a pergunta que eu fiz, o Arnaldo respondeu bem, bem o que eu tinha perguntado, é a uhum. questão do, dos fenômenos, né, os fenô uhum. dos fenômenos surgem uh, os grupos. Uh, eu vi tanto trabalho com a fase, com, às vezes com os números assim, nossa, 200 pessoas, né, uhum. e... Eu, eu, eu realmente acho que os, uh, os afásicos, cada fásico é único, né? Então, uma, a dificuldade de, de, de enquadrá-lo, tá? No, é, não dá. Na, não, na assim, semiologia é muito difícil. É, muito difícil. Né? E fazer um, um agrupamento baseado uh, na, no local de lesão, por exemplo, é uhum, difícil. É difícil. Né? Não, não, As experiências não. prévias da pessoa é difícil. A crítica que eu faço, Sabrina, é assim, esses estudos mais quantitativos com essas questões tão, tão subjetivas, né, e mesmo da relação cérebro-linguagem, os métodos às vezes acabam jogando fora o sujeito para ficar com o um método, entendeu? Quer dizer, descarta o sujeito e as suas variações individuais e tenta pegar coisas abstratas que na verdade não existem, né, então não existem. O agramatismo mesmo, isso que o Arnaldo estuda, é um fenômeno raro, né, Agora, você uhum. junta 200, não, não tem, é, você está pegando não coisas ter, diferentes, é. né? Então, às vezes, para garantir um N de pesquisa que seja aceitável num paper, você acaba colocando coisas muito diferentes, e aí o método acaba sendo privilegiado, uhum. e não aquilo que de fato acontece na linguagem, né? Então, uhum. É uma opção. É uma e opção a valorização teórica. do indivíduo, né? Fazer é. um trabalho profundo com o indivíduo, né? Tem um impacto... Uh, nessa pessoa, né, Sim. muito grande, assim. É, pra é, gente isso é muito importante. É. Cada conquista muito que eles têm, a gente comemora muito. É, às vezes, eles demoram, sei lá, 15, 20 minutos para dizer uma palavra que eles estão querendo dizer e não conseguem. Então, quando consegue, assim, é uma celebração, uma comemoração do grupo inteiro. Tá vendo? Conseguiu. Por exemplo, no dia que essa moça queria falar a cidade onde ela foi pescar, não conseguia, ela mostra o salto do sapato, para nós foi uma coisa assim, gente, olha a complexidade disso, né? Agora a gente tem que saber que tem homonímia, então o salto do sapato é o mesmo nome do salto da cachoeira, isso é uma, uma ferramenta que a linguística dá pra gente, pra gente poder entender. Não quer dizer que se ela fizesse isso para alguém na casa dela, eles iriam entender, né? Mas, assim, ela vai construindo esses recursos, né? Ela chegou só falando depois, depois, né? Assim, né? Não, antes, antes, depois, depois. Ela, ela é, não conseguia uh, fazer um gesto que fosse simbólico e que os outros pudessem compreender. Então, nesse trabalho, ela foi se desenvolvendo, ela tem essa dificuldade icônica que o João falou, de juntar as coisas no enunciado, assim como ela tem com a escrita, como ela tem para falar, mas a gente vê que os processos de significação estão ali, né? Então ela não perdeu, ela tem que reorganizar, achar processos alternativos. E é uma riqueza muito grande, né? Então, isso ensina muita coisa para a gente. Bem, bem interessante. Continuo, reitero que vocês estão de parabéns pelo trabalho. Obrigada, Sabrina, obrigada pelo então, seu todos interesse. Os trabalhos também, apresentados né? aqui. E pelo trabalho que vocês fazem lá com essas pessoas. Obrigado. Obrigada, que bom ter você Obrigada, aqui nessa Sabrina. sala. Obrigada. É, foi, foi um diferencial, assim, a gente, eu sabia desde o começo, né, você falou, não sei se meus alunos viram, que você falou, né, trabalhou com a Fazia um tempo tal. Isso. Então é interessante quando a gente também tem alguém com quem conversar que tem interesse pelas coisas que a gente faz, né? É, eu escolhi, foi, <risos> eu escolhi estar na sala. Ah, que bom, obrigada. Acho que valeu muito a pena. Ah, tá, muito obrigada, obrigada, então, Sabrina. A gente se vê por aí. Nos em vemos. outros congressos presenciais. 
se Deus quiser. É, é né? Então, tá. Obrigada, gente. Joana, Obrigada a todos. Ronaldo, Obrigada. Obrigada a todos. Beijo. A gente se fala. Tchau, tchau.